This is one of just four public psychiatric hospitals in the whole of Yemen. This is horrific. There's people in chains walking around. These guys are getting given their tranquilizers for the day to control them. It really just feels like this is a prison. It's not a hospital. Yemen has been caught in a vicious war for more than six years. Fueled by a bitter Iran-Saudi rivalry, it's the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Over 230,000 people have died. Millions are displaced. With both sides intentionally targeting hospitals and healthcare clinics, more than half the country's medical facilities have been closed. Do you know why you were brought here? Assam fought on the front lines of the war with the internationally recognized government. He reflects on the glory and brushes over the trauma that comes with it. You were a fighter on the front lines, right? Can you tell me a little about, about your time there? Aston was brought here by the security forces who noticed him struggling to cope with what he was witnessing. He's been here for seven months along with 143 other patients. Dr. Adel Mully is the director of this facility. He's worked here since 2003. He says that stigma combined with the extreme stress of war is why so many family members end up bringing their loved ones here. He admits that with their frequent use of restraint and tranquilizers, his work is more about keeping people in than rehabilitating them to get out. Is it not inhumane to be holding people with mental health issues inside an area like this and putting them in chains. I am doing this for their benefit. It's unhuman, but it is must. If I leave him outside and keep him in situation, he will kill his sisters. Do you want me just to cry for the sisters after he killed them? I don't want any patient here. I have to do this, otherwise they will run away. Who do you blame for the lack of resources that you have right now to treat these patients? The war is the blame. The war which puts us in this situation. And you are coming to blame us. We are not to blame. How much worse has the mental illness situation become since the beginning of the war? It become very, very permanent and it will be very, very permanent. What is here now is just the spark. The lightning doesn't start. The new cases will come. American soldiers went to Vietnam and had a war. Now they are suffering now. They went to the Gulf. Gulf War syndrome is now. This war, these situations, this mental uh, burden, this stress, this tragedy which happens to us is going to bring a picture of mental illness in the future. I am afraid we will not be able to face or we will not be able to cure. Dr. Adel is one of only 40 psychiatric specialists still left in the country. Doctors specializing in mental illnesses have become increasingly rare, with many leaving the country to work in less dangerous and less stressful conditions. What would happen if you guys weren't here? If I won't be here, it's my duty. I love these patients. I love my job. I'm suffering. I'm getting angry. I'm getting hypertension. But every morning I have to come and do my work. How difficult is it for you to be doing this job and knowing that you're not able to provide everything that these patients... Blaming myself is the only thing which I can do. Mm -hmm. 
More than one-fifth of Yemenis are likely to be suffering from depression, post-traumatic stress disorder or psychosis, according to the World Health Organization. At this public psychiatry hospital in Aden, they can only afford to receive patients twice a week. It's really, really heartbreaking seeing all these people coming in here desperate any kind of help with very serious mental health problems they're facing. Pretty much all of them so far have been either directly or indirectly for six years of very intense conflict. Siham Ali is the head nurse here, and just a few months away from retirement. She's counting down the days. With her budgets constantly being pinched, she's finding it increasingly difficult to see all the patients who come looking for help. Since the war, how have Yemeni's mental health needs changed? <laughs> Halfway through our tour, Nurse Siham is interrupted by someone trying to get a friend with severe psychosis the help he needs. <laughs> Siham turned the psychosis patient away. Are you okay? No. So you had to turn away these patients that needed help? It seems like a very, very stressful job for you to have to deal with. I mean, how, how are you coping? If the Prophet ﷺ was alive and the Prophet ﷺ saw the image of that young Yemeni child whose bones, whose rib cages were so pronounced and then dying because they don't have proper food and drink, what do you think the Prophet ﷺ would do? When you're dealing with a humanitarian disaster with over 20 million people in need of aid, over 8 million of whom don't have proper access to food, you put yourself in a world alone with them. So I want you to actually tune out everybody else Else that's involved, all the political factors involved. And I want it to just be you, the people of Yemen right now, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about Allah confronting you with these images on the Day of Judgment and asking you, did you not see what was happening to these beloved servants of mine? Did you not see what was happening to these children that were so beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Combating hunger is a fundamental pillar of our faith tradition. Of the earliest revelations, brothers and sisters, even before Allah legislated prayer five times a day, even before Allah legislated Psalm of Ramadan, even before Allah legislated the zakats, imagine before you had to pray, there was one commandment to worship Allah and the second commandment that came down in the Quran, the second commandment was to feed the hungry. وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَانًا وَلَا شُكُرًا And the believers are those who give of their own food even though they need that food but they give it to others and they give it to the faqir, to the miskeen, to the prisoner of war and Allah says when they give of their food they say to the person don't thank us, don't thank us we are feeding you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you give to others Allah will will give back to you is very simple. When you give to others, Allah will give back to you. For how long will we give? For as long as we're happy to receive. Simple as that. For how long will we give? For as long as you want to get from Allah, you will continue to give and give and give and give. And on judgment day, as long as you continue to show your generosity with whatever you have, just give and give and give. And Allah will reward you in this world and of course in the world to come.